Good morning, Ike. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not a new face up here, but uh, new to maybe being in front and leading worship. My name's Ike Sheehan, and uh, normally on the drums back there, but I thought I'd just be a crate instead and the drums and no, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great morning to come into God's house and worship the Lord with uh, fellow believers and uh, yeah, what a great morning it is. I uh, was invited by Stephen to help lead worship today because he's preaching the sermon and the, the sermon that he, he said that he's going to preach today is on practical missions, the practical side of, of missions. And uh, song I thought about doing um, was, was build your kingdom here because uh, we, we want to be used by God to build his kingdom here on this earth. And so Jesus's physical body is not here on this earth anymore. So it's our job to really be the hands and feet of Jesus and to go out and do what Jesus would do. And so this gathering at Pleasant View Church of Christ every Sunday, um, I, I'm reminded uh, in this song that it, it, this gathering's part of a larger kingdom. Um, we're, we're part of the global church, capital C church, the global body of Christ. And uh, yeah, our our Christian campus house that I'm on staff with at Trine University, we had a we had a guest speaker uh, recently named Pete Coco, who um, man he he's worked in missions and he's done campus ministry and he. Um, he, he's written books and created source material, and, and his, his big thing is gathering um, our body around the idea of mission. If you get, in, instead of just gathering around worship or gathering around the idea of community, gather around mission because then, then community and worship will flow from that. Um, Jesus said that the, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. And so I want us to be excited to go be builders of God's kingdom here on this earth. So would you stand as, as we worship today? Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now we are your church we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize. To see the captives' hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show streets and land set your church on fire win this nation back change the atmosphere build your kingdom here we pray unleash your kingdom's power Kingdom here, let the dark. 
on fire Win this nation back Change the atmosphere Build your kingdom here We pray Build your kingdom here Let the darkness fear Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Send your church on fire Win this nation back Change the atmosphere Build your kingdom here We pray Amen Well, as, as cool as it is to be builders of the kingdom of God, um, we're, we're really more so building upon a foundation that was laid already. And who laid that foundation other than Jesus Christ himself? Um, his main message when he was here on the earth, his main message was that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's near. Um, that was his main message that he went around the nations and, and spoke. And so people repented and they believed in the name of Jesus. And he would later go on to pay for our sins on a, on a cross that he did not deserve to die on. And um, as this next song that we're about to sing says, he, he humbly came to the earth that he himself created. Um, and it was here on this earth that all righteousness was fulfilled in him. And therefore, we, we simply trust in his name and um, it's in Jesus' name that we're saved. And so this is why we worship. It's, it's, it's that Jesus came and died for our sins. Oh 
to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. surrender all to you in Jesus' name, and and we trust in you. Lord, we we trust that you're going to use us when we show up and we 
live in obedience to you. And, and Lord, we, we know that we're going to see great things when we do that. And so we surrender our lives to you, God. Uh, Lord, I thank you so much for this gathering of the saints and the believers. And Lord, we just pray that you'd use this time to help us be better believers leaving here than we were when we came, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. It's great to see everybody here today on a beautiful day. That sunshine out there is uh, just uh, always nice. You know, it's great to see Ike up here. You know, it seems like it wasn't too long ago when he was walking through our front, the door of the church here as a student at Trine, and then uh, to move to the spot he's at right now. And great to see all our Trine students here, and I see some family along, and. Uh, Everybody here, you know, and that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning. It's, uh, oh, and Michael told me that I'm no longer able, he doesn't want me making fun of him while I'm standing up here because he's watching. But uh, I said, you just give me too much ammunition, Mike, you know. Uh, I'm going for it. He said he was going to a food truck place down there where the food trucks all come in. And uh, I know his love of liver and onions. I said, if you find a liver and onions food truck, please send me a picture. And I haven't got it yet, but uh, one of the things I love about our church, I, lo I love everything about this church here. I just love the people that gather. And I think that's what our sermon series this week or month has just been very inspiring to me. And, and one of those was how we need each other, you know. And if you just sit here in church and just look down the pews and the, and the rows and you'll see we all come in. You know, different ages and different sizes and different shapes and different political affiliations and maybe our sports teams. You know, we all have different, but uh, the one thing we do have in common is our last name, and that's child of a one true God. And uh, that's what I love about communion here at the church is we take that together as a family and uh, how we need each other because we're in this together. And uh, we need every single one of us to uh, just keep lifting each other up. And, uh, you know, we're all unique in our own ways, but uh, the one thing we do have in common is that God loved us so much that he was willing to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for us. And so for me, this is always a time of celebration and a remembrance when we do communion that, uh, you know, we can just truly feel that love and how powerful that is. And so many times when I'm struggling through the day or uh, I'll see somebody walk through the front door of the church here and it just lifts me up to see that person or if I run into them out in the community, uh, I just know that's a fellow believer that I have in Christ and we're in this together. So just keep that on your mind today as, uh, you know, and, and give away what we've gotten here in this church. Give it away to some stranger. Just love them as we've been loved. So let's go to prayer this morning. Father God, you've just given us so much, and we have so much to be grateful for, Lord. Every time we gather in your house and uh, we gather just to come and worship you, and you know, we come to you, each, each one of us, in our own unique way. But the thing that's not unique is how you loved each and every one of us loved us so much that you were willing to send your son Jesus to die on the cross. Son, he just gave us so much. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.
And this is from the book of Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, let us do likewise. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to him, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us also. We'll go ahead and pray over our offerings, and our offering boxes are in the back of the church. And we do give you an opportunity to give online. Lord, we just pray that... Uh, we as a church take the offerings that the congregation present to you, Lord. We pray that um, you take those offerings and make them pleasing to you. Help us as a church that we use those offerings in a way that's pleasing to you and help us to reach a world that's so desperately hurting. We pray that you be with Stephen this morning as he brings us the message, that it touches our hearts, and then we take it outside of these rooms. We pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. All right, good morning, church. And thank you, Ike, for leading us in, in worship, giving me the opportunity to sing a little bit of harmony as well. I'm a little bit out of practice, so thanks for that. Uh, man, it's hard to believe that it is almost the month of March. Uh, and for many, that means spring break or midterms. Uh, for others, that means just spring in general. And hopefully things will be warming up a little bit soon as well. Uh, we do have a few things coming up soon in March uh, for our junior and senior high students. We still have the winter camp out at Lake James. Uh, the second weekend in March, there's still open registration for that. Uh, really looking forward to it. Uh, it's always a great time of discipleship and connection and community. If you'd like more info on that, just uh, see me right after the service here. And also, uh, if you are following along with like prayer journals, you can go ahead and grab those. We've got plenty in our foyer as well. Uh, because March will be here before next Sunday. So if you want to get a head start on uh, grabbing those, feel free to do so. And uh, we'll just look forward to a wonderful March. And we've got, I know, a St. Patrick's Day dinner for the Trifocals uh, coming up in there. Uh, we'll elaborate a little bit more on our March events later. Uh, but we are at the final part of our servant series for this month. Uh, Michael comes back next week, and I do thank him for the opportunity uh, to be able to preach while he's away and that he's given me the trust uh, to do so. And also thank you for, for Matthew who helped with uh, one of the sermons as well. Uh, so this is the final sermon of our servant series. And uh, this is more of probably the action part. Uh, we've talked a lot of theory. We've talked a lot of theology. Uh, and we'll still do a little bit of that today as well. But this is how can we take the things we've learned over the last few weeks and put them into action? And if this is your first time visiting us uh, or you weren't here over the last few weeks, we'll do a quick recap, uh, just a rapid fire, the main points uh, from each of the last few weeks. And if you see the title, it says go. No, this isn't a continuation of the board game series that Michael did last year. Uh, this is just taking things we've learned and then going with it. Uh, but for the first Sunday of the month, we talked about our identity in Christ and how because we are made in the image of God, and the things that he has called us to do, we have servant identities. So that was all what we talked about for the first week, our identity as servants and how we can't be separated from that. In the next week, we talked about our motivation for service. Uh, why should we serve? Is it out of just philanthropy? Is it because we want us to be seen as better than we really are? Uh, what, uh, Matthew brought us that message and told us, uh, from scripture that our motivation to serve others is love. Not our own personal gratification or for pride, but out of a devotion to Jesus Christ and a love for our neighbor. And then last week we talked about our dependency and how we are fully dependent on God and he often uses people or others to meet those needs. We are of course fully dependent on God for our salvation but we're also dependent on him for our purpose and our sustenance. And God often uses his people to meet our needs and to remind us of that purpose. So that kind of begs the next question that we're going to try to answer today. How then do we fulfill our role as servants of God? 
How do we serve? And I want us to start out first uh, with a few passages of Scripture that will help us to understand that one of the best ways we can serve is by being present, to be present. We'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So already we see Paul talking about the model for his ministry. And if you know the life of the Apostle Paul, he would often go into cities, he would start in the synagogues and, and preach to the Jews about, hey, this guy Jesus has come. Uh, and he would teach about Jesus' life and, and what that means for the world. And then if they would accept him, he would continue to teach and disciple them. And if they wouldn't, he would just go out into the community and preach to anyone who would listen, but he would do that by building a bridge between the gospel and people. He says, like in verse 20, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. He would follow many of their customs. He would follow many of their traditions in order to gain their trust, not as a manipulation tactic, but out of love for them. And he would use his knowledge of Judaism to teach about Jesus. And then he talks about uh, the Gentiles in verse 21. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Uh, he says, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. And it's one of those passages, too, that when you read a word so many times, it starts to stop sounding like a word when you see law, 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 law. It can be easy to get uh, lost in all of this. But he's basically saying that I'm building bridges to the Gentiles. I'm connecting with them. And he would use sometimes his status as a Roman citizen to do so. Or he would use different cultural aspects to try to connect with the people around him to build a bridge between the gospel and people. Essentially, he was being present with them. He didn't necessarily carry in all of his own assumptions about a culture. Oftentimes, he would live in the city for a while and uh, build relationships and make these connections. But one of the best ways that we can serve is to build a bridge between people and the gospel. And part of that means we have to know others' needs by listening and asking questions. We'll talk a little bit uh, more about this later, but uh, how many of you have ever helped somebody with something, but that wasn't actually what they really needed? Um, and we can probably come up with a few different examples uh, of things like that, but when we listen to others and we actually understand uh, what their struggles are, what their, maybe their problems are, we can then serve them better. Uh, and part of that is by asking questions. Sometimes when we're helping somebody, uh, they might think, oh, I need this. But then if we ask questions, it helps to guide the conversation and say, okay, well, really, I need something that's at the root of that cause. And so we need to know others' needs by listening and asking questions. Uh, we talked about in a sermon last year how many questions Jesus answered directly that were asked of him. Like he just asked, like someone asked Jesus this question and he just responds right away with his answer. And it was less than 20. But when someone asked Jesus a question, how many times did he respond with a question? Well, over a hundred times. Because he wasn't just about saying uh, all these different things, saying all these powerful truths. He wanted people to understand them. So he would ask questions, see where they're coming from. Although as Jesus he more or less already knew, but he would ask those questions to try to help them understand the things that he was teaching. So we can serve by knowing others' needs and uh, by listening and asking questions. And I think the last part we can take away from these verses is to put ourselves in positions to serve. Uh, and what I mean by that is Paul would go into these cities and he would put himself in positions to interact with other people, to learn about their culture, to learn about them once again. I think it can be easy in this, this life to be uh, kind of siloed off. And here's an example. At 
Huntington University, we would call it the Huntington bubble, where everything was kind of contained at our school. We could always like just walk down across campus to get food. There's a library there. And what became really easy was to detach ourselves from the, the wider community, the wider town. And yeah, we might help out other fellow students with things, but because we were so sometimes so detached from the town, we'd forget that they need service as well. And while maybe at points our university was running well and we were serving one another and building this great community, we weren't reaching out into the city of Huntington and meeting their needs and being present with them. So that was a constant struggle through, through our years uh, at Huntington University. And oftentimes we would break out of it by recognizing that and recognizing that, hey, we can serve each other here in our own little community, but we should also put ourselves in position to serve those outside our community as well. So we can serve by being present. And the next thing is probably one of the most obvious statements we can take away from service is to serve to meet real needs. Let's go to Matthew 25, verses 31 through 40. And Jesus says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So when we serve others, we serve Jesus. But think about the examples that Jesus gives in this scenario. Hunger, thirst, shelter, clothing, even things such as the compassion, connection, and community uh, when he references visiting him in prison or when he's sick. So how do we serve? Well, there isn't one specific way, but here are a few keys to remember. And I think these are always uh, just great things to have in our back pocket when we're thinking about serving someone or an organization. And I think the first thing we can always keep in our mind when serving others is to stop the bleeding. And what I mean by this is, let's think about the, uh, the famous phrase, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. It's like most everybody has heard probably that at some point. There's one problem I have with that phrase. It's really hard to teach someone who's starving or to teach someone who's bleeding out. And we talk about this uh, in most of our uh, missions classes. Uh, I went to Huntington, as I already mentioned, but I also majored in missions. And one thing that always came up in our classes was the first thing to recognize in any situation is to stop the bleeding. And you see this a lot in disaster relief scenarios where uh, a co community will go or a people will go to serve a community that's been wrecked maybe by a tsunami or an earthquake or a tornado. And their main mission at first is to just meet the basic needs, to make sure that people have food for the day, water for the day, and a shelter to stay in for the night. And uh, if we were to just take uh, one phrase that uh, we talked about it in school is, if someone's suffering from that, like their house is completely destroyed and we're trying to help them get back on their feet, maybe the first thing to ask isn't, hey, do you have a budget? Well, yeah, it's in the rubble of our house. We can't really do much about that. We need these basic needs first. And then from that, once people have those basic needs, once the bleeding has been stopped, then we can move on to the next step, which we'll get to in a second. Now, this is the model of missions that we see a lot from IDES uh, and the Red Cross. So when we take our, uh, do our meal prep for IDES or build the shelters or whatever it is that they need for that time, we're basically stopping the bleeding. A community that's been devastated by 
you know, AIDS International Disaster Emergency Services, a community that's been devastated by a disaster, uh, they'll go in and they'll use the local people in the local community to just meet basic needs first. And so after we stop the bleeding, the next thing is to create self-sufficiency. And now, if you're thinking back to last week's sermon, this seems like it's kind of going against what we talked about last week, that we are dependent on God and dependent on other people. Uh, but here's an example I think will help this to make sense. The primary goal I have as a cross-country coach isn't to win. And it isn't really to make sure all the kids have fun either. That's oftentimes uh, what people might ask. My goal is to give them the tools and the training that they need to enjoy and to love running. And if I do that, usually more kids have fun, and usually we do a lot of winning as well. So that's always my primary goal, is to make sure that our students have the tools and the training they need just to love running. Now, in some cases, I hear that some people just don't love running at all, as I was kind of smiling back there. Um, <laughs> but there are others who maybe start out, they're not sure if they want to be a part of this sport, they're not sure if they want to, to stay as part of the team, but if by the end, uh, by the time they're done with our eighth grade, if they're like, yeah, I want to go run for the high school, I want to keep this up, then I've helped to build their own self-sufficiency. Because in the, in the beginning, in the first couple weeks of practice, it takes a lot of time and investment to make sure they know how to do their stretches, their warm-ups, and that they actually go a decent pace for the warm-ups and not going too fast. Uh, and just this very hands-on, try to control as many things as I can, but after all that investment, by the end of the season, I barely have to do anything. I can just say, all right, you do three miles. You've got all these options to pick from that you've, used, that you've run before. Just go out and do it. And there's sometimes in the last couple weeks of practice that I do do just that. But the thing is, they build self-sufficiency. So it takes a lot of investment and takes a lot of dependence. But because of that, because of walking them through that, they're able to then enjoy running on their own. So what does this mean for service? No one will ever be truly self-sufficient. But when a person has a struggle that becomes so large that you can't see around it, it can spiral into more and more problems. A good servant will be able to walk alongside a person who's struggling and empower them with the tools they need to rise above their major struggle. And that could take the form now of, okay, we've got your food problems secured for this month, Let's work together on a plan so that this doesn't happen again. And we see this model in places like Turning Point, uh, or the Woodburn Christian Children's Home, where they don't just meet a need at first, but they will walk alongside uh, the person who has those needs, the people that they're serving, and help them to build up their own skills and, and their own uh, maybe budgets or whatever it is to help them to be as self-sufficient as they can be. And the goal is so that way then they can take that servant attitude, take that service to the people that they meet after that. And I think the next thing when it comes to service that is so often forgotten is to build connections. It won't come to a surprise to anyone here that I am not a surgeon. If someone has to have heart surgery, as much as I love that person and want to serve them, I cannot perform that procedure. And you don't want me to perform that procedure. So, man, that, that we kind of get to the, this impasse here. It's like, I can't really serve this person to meet their needs. But I know some people who are surgeons. So when we serve, we give others the opportunity to overcome their struggles and empower them with the gifts that God has given us. And this, in turn, gives them the opportunity to serve others and share the love of Jesus using the gifts that God has given them. And this creates a culture of service where people use their unique gifts to honor God, and through these connections, we can find appropriate help for specific needs and have someone to walk alongside that person. I might not have the best solution for your needs, but I guarantee there is someone who does. And by building connections, by building community, starting in our church and then reaching out into our community, well, we could work together to meet needs that we won't, wouldn't be able to serve on our own. And we see uh, great models for this in the local community foundation. I hear many times my wife saying to me, it's like, yeah, we just build connections between the people who need something and those who have the service and the help to give. And 
when it looks like that as a church, when we see a person who may be struggling with grief, uh, one of the best resources that we can have is to connect them with someone who has been through that grief and to talk and to walk through them with it. Uh, or if a person's struggling with an addiction, to connect them with someone who has been through that and who has struggled with that, and they can then walk together to, to meet their needs. And, and these acts of service can certainly happen at the institutional level, but they can also happen in your own personal lives as well. Uh, we talked about a friend overwhelmed with grief may need someone to stop the bleeding just by being present for them. Or a family member who's getting their electricity shut off may need immediate help, but then they might need someone to walk through them, uh, to walk with them uh, through a budget. Or a church member struggling with that addiction may need your help to make a connection to a place that can help to get them clean. And there's a lot of theory in what we've talked about so far. So let's take a look now at what Jesus tells us to go and do. And these are just three of the go statements of Jesus' life, because I don't want us to also lean too far into the, well, church is just about serving others and meeting their physical needs. Uh, there's more to it than just that. And we're going to start with John 8, 1 through 11, with the first of our go statements. So Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people, people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. And as a side note, Jesus probably knew that because it kind of takes two to tango when it comes to adultery, but they only brought in one. So they're obviously using this not as to fulfill the law and to look righteous, but just to test Jesus. So let's go back to verse 6. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So the first of these go statements is go and sin no more. So how does this passage relate to service? I think the first thing we can understand is that Jesus still cares about sin. He still cares that a person walks away from time with him, understanding that sin is not a good thing, that sin separates us from God, but he shows grace first. So when it comes to our service, show grace to those you are serving, but don't forget that Jesus desires a relationship with them too. It's not inappropriate to speak the truth in love to someone you're serving. Let's go now to Luke 10, 25 through 37, the second of our go statements today. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan... As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and banded his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, 
the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So our next go statement is to go and do likewise. One thing that Jesus was teaching us in this story is that anyone can serve and anyone can ignore service. Jesus didn't remark about the other good things that the priest and the Levite might have done in their life. He doesn't give a backstory for the priest or the or the Levites like, oh, well, they were on their way. They were, they were going to, to serve others where they were going, that sort of thing. He doesn't give us that. He talked about their inaction. And we'll come back to this in just a second. But that second of the go statement is to go and do likewise, to serve, to meet others' needs. Let's go to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20 now. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the go statement from this passage is go and make disciples. There's one common rebuttal uh, that we can hear as Christians when we, when we serve. And that's, you're only helping me because you want me to be a Christian. And thinking about that, that first response is like, no, I'm helping you because I also love you. But really diving into it, yeah, every single person who I serve, I want them to know and to love Jesus Christ, to know who he is and to have a relationship with him. And it's true that we can do this with the wrong intentions. Uh, we can do this, but it's like, I want to serve people so that we just kind of bump up church numbers or something like that. And, and while we want them to be a part of a church too, it's not about our own personal glory. Or some might serve others to obtain some sort of personal gratification by checking a box. It's like, oh, hey, look how great I am. I've served in all these places this last year. And so we, there are negative <laughs> reasons we have for service, and that goes just back to what Matthew talked about in his sermon, that our motivation for service is love, to love others. And in loving others, we're going to want them to know who Jesus is. We're going to want them to have eternal life with us in heaven. So our goal should always be to meet people where they are and to help them take the next step toward Jesus, wherever they are. And that's called discipleship, to go and make disciples. And then as we've walked with them, as we've taken them the next step in faith towards Jesus Christ, then hopefully uh, we've walked with them enough that then they can follow uh, Jesus as well. And then to walk with someone and make their own disciples. But the last thing I want us to take away from today is the famous Nike slogan, just do it. We're going to finish up with Matthew 25. These are the last five uh, verses of the story that we didn't talk about earlier. Uh, the first part, Jesus talks to people, uh, and he separates them, the sheep and the goats. That was the setup. And so he's already talked to those on his right, and he said, hey, whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Uh, come now into eternal life. So now we're at Matthew 25, 41 through 46. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There was a pretty famous uh, widespread ad campaign about 10 to 13 years ago is kind of the range that it was in. But there were all these commercials on almost serving, and it was kind of it pulled on your heartstrings a little bit because it would show this family maybe living in their car and it's like, here's this family that was almost helped by someone. Someone almost 
volunteered to meet this need. Uh, and there, there were several others like that as well. But I think so many times, even in my life, where I'm like, ah, no, I really should go to help out this group or to help out this mission. It's like, I, I almost went to it. In the eyes of Jesus, that's not helping. Almost serving isn't serving, so don't almost serve. But I also want us to, to take a, a quick second to understand that a person isn't saved because they served. They serve because they're saved. We don't do these acts of service to try to check boxes every day of our lives to stay in good standing with Jesus and to, to earn our way into heaven by doing these good things. But a person who is saved, a person who understands who Jesus is and has a relationship with him and is walking with him is going to want to serve others just as Jesus did. Jesus said his mission wasn't to be served, but to serve. And I want us to, before we close out, just close out with this idea too that serving can get really messy too. People will take advantage of your heart for service. There will be people you invest your heart and your soul into that fail, who betray you or who cast you off once you're no longer valuable to them. Because if it happened to Jesus, it's probably going to happen to us as well. I think about, man, how much time, energy, and, and life Jesus spent with Judas. And all that he poured out into him, the, the lessons that he was sharing, the, the journeys that he was taking, and yet he was still betrayed by one of his closest friends. Or all the time and effort Jesus put into serving and teaching Peter. And then in, in his moments right before his crucifixion, Peter denies Jesus three times. If it happened to Jesus, it'll probably happen to you. So what do we do when it gets messy? Don't forget to rely on the strength of God to carry you through. And that goes back to last week. If we're connected with God, we'll be able to endure those times when the people we serve just fail us. Uh, it, is going, it is going to happen. And it's very easy to get cynical, I think, from that. I think you know, we see it a lot with uh, high school students who go in to serve. And at first they're like super energetic. And then maybe as they get older, college, 30s, 40s, they get burned so many times by, man, I helped out these people and they didn't even thank me for it. They didn't even acknowledge me for it. Uh, or they just turn around and, and waste that service. And it makes me think of another story from Jesus when he healed so many people and only one came back to, uh, to thank him for it. So if it happens to Jesus, it'll happen to us as well. So we need to rely on the strength of God to carry us through. And if we're also taking last week in consideration, that's really hard to do on our own. So surround yourself with other people who can encourage you, who can walk with you to serve with others, serving others, uh, and rely on them to remind us that, hey, it's about loving Jesus. And people are going to fail you. They're also going to be great success stories. And that's what I hope we can share a lot on Sunday mornings, where Sunday morning worship service which is kind of interesting, we call it a worship service, right? Uh, that Sunday morning worship service can be a time where we gather together, share the successes of the week, invite the people that we are serving to church, connect them with other Christians, and connect them with God. To make this a connecting place, as one of our old mission statements or slogans was for so many years, to connect others to Christ and through service. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the gifts that you've given us. And God, as we have all different experiences in our lives, as we're surrounded by different communities, as we have those around us who have very unique, specific needs, God, we pray that you empower us to serve them. And God, when we don't have the resources or when we don't have the, the, the knowledge or the wisdom, we can turn to others who you've placed in our lives to reach out to them. Because God, we know that you are the true source of all wisdom, the true source of our purpose, and the true source of our hope. 
And God, we pray that we don't take those for granted or we don't uh, put that light uh, under a cover, but put it on a lampstand for all to see, not for our own glory or for our own gratification, but for yours, to reach out to our community, which is so desperately in need of so many things, whether those are physical needs, whether those are, are just a desire for connection, for compassion, for hope, God, that we can bring those to them, knowing that they come from you. And it's in your son, Jesus, precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Would you go ahead and stand to worship with us? Um, I hope you're inspired by that to go out and to serve and to do it in Jesus' name. And uh, this last song we want to sing, we want to ask God to use each and every one of us to open doors for us and that we would be obedient and walk through those doors and serve people. So would you join us? We've seen what you can do. Your power has no end. The things that you had done in greater measure, you will do again. Cause there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. All things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up, oh God of revival let hope arise death is overcome you've already won oh god of revival you rose in victory and now you're seated forever on the throne So why should my heart bear what you've defeated? I would trust in you alone. There's no prison wall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise. No soul that you can't save, all things are possible. The darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up. Oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome. awake in this city oh god of revival pour it out pour it out every stronghold will crumble hear the chains hit the ground oh god of revival pour it out pour it out come awaken your people Come awake in the city, oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble, hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The 
darkest night, you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, you've already won. city oh God of revival pour it out pour it out every stronghold will crumble hear the chains hit the ground oh God of revival pour it out pour it out come awaken your people come awaken the city God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. God of well, thank you everyone for being here this morning. We hope that you enjoy the transition into March and that uh, once again that you can take the love and the joy and the peace of Jesus Christ and, and not just keep it here in the church this morning but take it out to your homes, to your, your jobs, your families, schools, wherever that may be uh, to carry the love and the light of Christ with you wherever you go. Have a great week. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear.